If you have your Bibles, turn if you may to Psalm 123. Psalm 123. Psalm 123, unto thee lift, I, lift I my, up, I, up my eyes, O thou dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the eye hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress. So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are a sinly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the pride. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come into your word, speak to us through your word, encourage us and strengthen us through this message. Uh, use this message to bring glory and honor and praise to your name. May our eyes of understanding be opened further as a result of this message. And Father, I just pray that you definitely speak to the online audience that will be seeing this in the days ahead. Thank you that more people are clicking on to the videos that we've done um, here at Hilltop Bible Church and pray that uh, the, you will speak to them through this video and I give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Once, we'll, once again, doing a series of messages on the Psalms of Assets. Uh, the Psalms of Assets were Psalms 120 to 134. And the reason they're called the Psalms of Assets is that these were psalms that Israelites would sing when they would go to Jerusalem for uh, the uh, holidays or for worship in the temple. They would, a lot of times they would sing these psalms to each other as they would go up the hills to Jerusalem, especially as they would go to the temple. And as I mentioned, I was going to do a series of messages on these. I'm not going to do a series of messages on all of them, but I was going, I'm doing it. Uh, this is the second of a four-part series on these psalms. Anyway, these psalms, like many of the psalms, are, for a large part, prayers. We can pray them for ourselves, our church, and for others we know. And I encourage you that Read the Psalms from time to time and pray the prayers that are in the Psalms. Praying for yourself and praying for others. This particular Psalm briefly summarizes the terminate history of God's people. Israel, to whom this Psalm was originally written to, the Israelite pilgrim who traveled to Jerusalem, the one who sung some of these Psalms, suffered much from pagan and overlord neighbors who oppose God and them. We see that throughout the Old Testament. The psalm also summarizes briefly the terminate history of the Church of Jesus Christ over its nearly 2,000 year history. And that's mainly what we see in verses 3 and 4. Anyway, the first point that I want to bring out is looking to God. The psalmist says, unto thee lift I up let die my eyes. We look upward. As I mentioned, this psalm is a prayer. The lifting of one's eyes indicates prayer. 
It also indicates a looking away beyond one's own resources to a higher power, that power being God Almighty. The eyes that are looking up are the eyes of the mind and understanding that have been opened up by the Holy Spirit, particularly the eye of faith by which we look for and expect help from God. In looking upward, we are expressing holy confidence in God and a comfortable hope of receiving good things from him. In looking up to heaven, we're not only looking up to where God dwells, but where he also rules from. It is in heaven that God manifests his glory as a king in his court. From there, God sees the needs of his people, including you that are in here today, including you that are going to see this on video. He sees the needs of his people and sends help. Now, I want to mention to you, even though God, the temple of God was in Jerusalem, Israel did not just see God as dwelling in that temple. He, they saw God as he is dwelling all over the place. In Psalm 113, we have these particular words. Psalm 113, starting at verse 4. Psalm 113, 4. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Think of this. God is above all nations. He's above the United States. He's above Russia. He's above China. He's above all the 200 nations that are on this planet. He's above every ruler that rules and reigns on this planet. Verse 5. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humble himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. God humbles himself when he looks upon us and even makes our needs. Jesus surely humbled himself when he came to earth. And he came to earth, the scripture says, to seek and to save that which was lost. He humbled himself when he came to earth to die on the cross that will eventually result in the salvation of many people over the last 2,000 years, including those of us that are here today and those of you that are watching on the video. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27 says that the heavens and the earth cannot contain God. In the New Testament, Stephen in his address to the Jews mentioned that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Acts chapter 7, verse 48 and 49. Paul said something similar in Acts chapter 17, verse 24. In looking up to God, we are not only looking up to where he is, but we're looking up to who he is. The Lord God Almighty, who is great indeed, and does as he pleases. Psalm 115.3 As the people of God, our eyes are ever towards God. We look to him as our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when we use the expression, hallowed be thy name, what we're saying is, holy is the name of God. Holy is the nature and character of God. We look to him, not as just somebody we can ask favors from, but one to whom we give all and worship to. Let us continue to have reverence towards our God. Now the second point is that we look to God for mercy. We are dependent on God. Notice in verse 2, that as the eyes of the servants look into the hand of their master, and as the eyes of the maiden look into the hand of the mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God. Paul and the apostles considered themselves slaves of God, or slaves of Christ. They would open their epistles with that, name, with that mention. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. You may want to munch, go to that verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Let's go to verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The Bible says, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to God. Therefore, we are people under the lordship of God. God is addressed here as the Lord in Psalm 123. In fact, he is addressed as the Lord throughout the Bible, Old the New Testament. As the Lord, he keeps his covenant with us, his people. And he keeps covenants with us through the finished work of redemption that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. We see that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid a heavy price. He paid to redeem us from the bondage of sin. We were in bondage to sin. There was no way we could pay the price. And Jesus, the perfect sacrifice for our sins, when he died on the cross, he paid in full the debt we owe. He redeemed us from sin, paying to God the debt that we owe. Therefore, we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're servants of the Most High God. We look to God for good from him and direction. And the way to get direction from God is to get into his word and to pray and seek his face. That's the way to get direction from God. As the Lord, he reigns over us. Back then, back in the days of the Bible, when a person was a Lord, it wasn't like today where you could criticize your leaders all you want. Well, you didn't have to pay them any regard. Well, you could demonstrate and protest against them all the time or have recall petitions. That didn't take place back in those days. When a person was Lord, they had absolute authority. When they said something, it was to be obeyed. And disobedience was punished. And so God is Lord. And we, as his People under his lordship are our obligation to obey his every command. God is the Lord of all, even though it's his only, only his people that acknowledge that presently. As the children of God, though, we can say with that and Thomas, as he said in John chapter 20, verse 29. My Lord and my God. Every one of us that are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and saved, God is our Lord and he is our God. Jesus is our Lord and he is our Savior. And that's good news. Being under the Lordship of Christ, we are utterly dependent upon God for every aspect of our well-being, spiritually and physically. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, and I encourage you to pray that prayer from time to time. Pray that for yourself. Pray that for others. Pray that for this church. And definitely pray the part. Give us this day our daily bread. What, is, what are you saying when you're praying that? You're praying to God that he will meet your every need. Now one day, Every knee will bow and acknowledge what we're already doing, that God is the Lord, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's coming. Hopefully it'll be soon, but it's coming. 
Now concerning mercy that we see in verse 2, notice the, the psalmist cries, have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. The word mercy means a pity that results in action. And of course, the cross of Christ is the greatest act of mercy. God in his pity towards sinners sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we can receive mercy and salvation. God's mercy endures forever. Psalm 106, verse 1. Mercy is what God has towards us. And we serve a very merciful God. And we, his people, are in continuous need of mercy. It is good to know that Lamentations chapter 3 is, a, is applied applicable today, which says the Lord's mercies are renewed every morning. That's a good promise to stand on. Another promise that we can stand on is found in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Here we are commanded, but we're also given a promise. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. This is the verse I really like. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You need mercy today? Cry to the Lord. You need grace today? Cry to the Lord. You got needs today? Cry to the Lord. Cry to the Lord. His mercy is not only in meeting needs, but directing our lives, protecting us both physically and spiritually. And spiritual protecting involves securing us in our salvation in Christ. The reason we're able to stay safe is because of the mercy of our God. And actually, anything that God does for us is mercy, whatever it is. The psalmist talks about waiting until he has mercy on us. And we need, when we pray, to wait expectantly for the answer. The answer may not come in for years, but we wait expectantly for that answer. We wait expecting for what we want and need from God. I was talking about it last week. This might have been last week. I think it was last week or the week before. I can't remember exactly where, but I mentioned about a lady that really... Uh, inspired me. She's gone on to be with the Lord. She told me in the situation I was facing, she told me, pray until the answer comes. And the, the uh, particular matter that was most concerned me, the matter that I went to her about, where I did just that, I prayed about that, and the answer came within weeks. In fact, two weeks after I saw her, the start of that answer came. That blew me away. We need more of that. God answered in such a way that it'll blow us away. The South Phoenician woman was a woman that waited on God and prayed until she got answered. She came to Jesus and said, Jesus, my daughter is oppressed with a demon. Will you set her free? And Jesus was silent. He was testing her. The disciples were screaming in the house and said, Lord, get this woman away. But she kept crying. This was a Gentile woman, not a Jewish woman, she said, but she called Jesus son of David. She acknowledged what many Jews wouldn't do, that he was the Messiah. Son of David, heal my daughter. And Jesus said, I come to the lost sheep of Israel. But yes, Lord, my daughter needs to be set free. Jesus said, we don't, we, don't, uh, provide, we don't provide the children bread for dogs. And then she said, the Lord, even the dogs, eat the crumbs from the table. And Jesus said, 
God of faith. The faith is answered, has been answered. Go. The scripture says the daughter was healed at that. We need to be like the South and Asian women to pray until the answer comes. And let's not forget to thank God when the answer comes. We look for mercy in the midst of contempt. One reason we continue to need mercy is that we're filled with contempt. Or rather, we face contempt and scorn from this sin-loving, Christ-rejected world. Contempt means disgrace, insult, reproach. It refers to humiliation, slanderous, condemning speech poured out on someone. And we sure got a lot of contempt towards the Church of Jesus Christ in our world today. In Scotland, we're about ready to pass a so-called hate speech crime bill that's going to basically outlaw Christian preaching. Crime is going skyrocketing in Great Britain, but they're more concerned about so-called hate speech than they are robbery and murder and raping. And it's getting that way in this country too, I'm afraid. But nonetheless, this kind of contempt goes deeper into the spirit than any other form of rejection. And yet, this contempt can be an honor. In Acts chapter 4, the disciples rejoiced that they were able to suffer for the Lord. Jesus said, Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward. We can rejoice even though we are opposed in our service to the king. God's people have always been at the contempt of those outside the faith. We had Cain and Abel. Abel offered sacrifice acceptable to God. Cain did not. Cain hated his brother for it and killed him. Ishmael was the son of Abraham in the flesh. Isaac was the son of Abraham through promise. We see that Ishmael and persecuted Isaac. Esau, a profane man, was an enemy of his own brother Jacob, a son of promise. Joseph suffered at the hands of his brothers. You know there's a lot of confess professing uh, churchgoers that have contempt towards those that truly believe on Jesus. We'll talk more about that later. In this context, Israel faced the contempt of the surrounding nations. And then the church and the world. The church is facing the contempt from the world. As I mentioned, it seems that opposition to church increases just about every month. Over the last 12, 13 years, I've seen more opposition to church than I've seen all the previous years before that. It's getting worse. Jesus said, Moment, if the world hated me, it will hate you. John 15, 19. The opposition to the church, the opposition to the Lord, is proudful and scornful. Second Peter chapter 3 in Jude talks about mockers and scoffers in the last days. And as I mentioned, there's opposition from church folks. Well, the numerous times I would preach a very encouraging message in a church, not this church, and uh, not churches that I pastored in, but when, when I preached at other churches. There'd be times when I preached an encouraging message, and people didn't like it. People didn't like it. I remember one time I was preaching at a church, uh, I'm not going to say where, I was preaching on Joshua is when God told Joshua, be strong and be courageous. And that's what I was telling the people, be strong and be courageous. And I'll tell you one thing right now, if eyes could kill, I'd have been dead a hundred times. If I had preached hell by a brimstone, they would have probably taken me out to the streets and torn and feathered me. If you're going to get opposition from preaching sins like that, what are you going to do when you preach hard truth, which you have to speak on every now and then? The 
Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, one of the high ups in that denomination, made a public statement that they're going to cram the LGBT agenda upon their churches in the days ahead. That's the denomination that Martin Luther uh, Church over here belongs to. Now, I'm not knocking that church anyway. I'm just that that's from the denominational head. I read this just recently. They're going to cram that. They tend to cram that gender upon their churches. There are people that oppose the truth that sit in church pews every Sunday. And of course, there's also spiritual warfare. We are fighting spiritual warfare like none of before. Just when you think it's gotten bad, it gets worse. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. And a lot of what is happening is a result of satanic forces moving upon folks that are not committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see a rise of militant atheism, a rise in militant Islam, a rise in militant LGBT, a rise in militant feminism, a rise in anything that opposes the gospel, and it's satanic as well. The good news is that God is with us to fight the battles. He is with us to give us victory. So let's keep looking to the Lord, looking for mercies, no matter what. Let's keep holding his hand. Let's keep praying and seeking his face. And let's keep rejoicing in him. Let's continue to be submitted to his lordship. And for those of you out there that are going to see this on video, if you don't want Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's a good day to turn to him. The Bible says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Turn to him. I was reading the testimony of a famous British preacher, Charles Spurgeon. I read it before, time and time again. When he was a young boy, he went to a church service. And the speaker at that time, a layman, said, Son, look unto the Lord and live, quoting Isaiah. And Charles Spurgeon actually looked by faith unto the Lord and was saved that day. And this is many, many people coming to Christ over, over the rest of his life. Let me encourage you to look and let's pray. Father in Jesus, let the Holy Spirit do its work. Let the Holy Spirit accomplish your purpose. Do that. Let's pray. Accomplish your purpose right here. Accomplish your purpose in the lives of those that receive this on the video. Bring glory and honor to your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one more song.